Welcome to the H. Orton Wiley Lecture Series, sponsored by the School of Theology and Christian Ministry. Uh, my name is Dr. Montague Williams, and I'm a professor here in the School of Theology and Christian Ministry. Okay. And uh, I don't know if you were at the last uh, lecture, but if you were, you know that we're in the middle of a very exciting series and doing some really meaningful work here on this campus through this lecture series. Uh, we are so thankful that Dr. Brian Bantam is here. Uh, you may have heard him in chapel today as well. Uh, if this is your first time uh, coming to uh, one of the H. Orton Wiley lectures, just know this is something we do every year, and uh, it often is something that tends to stir interest and wonder about theological studies. If you do find yourself wondering about that, feel free to talk to any of the professors in the School of Theology. We're happy to chat with you. This session, uh, oh, also know that tomorrow there will be a lecture at 9.30 a.m. right here in Krill. This session will go for 50 minutes and there may be time for Q&A after. Uh, please make every effort to stay for the, whole, uh, for the whole time and if you have to slip out, please do so very quiet, quietly. Uh, let me just give you some quick highlights uh, about Dr. Bantam. He's the Associate Professor of Theology at Seattle Pacific University. Throughout his professional career, Dr. Bantam has worked on the intersections of Christian theology, race, and identity. He's the author of several works on this topic uh, that you can see in that brochure that you have, such as The Death of Race and Redeeming Mulatto. Uh, let me just add a quick note and say that his work is actually very influential on my own life as a theologian and has helped me learn to do theology in a way that takes the body seriously. Let me just lastly say that uh, the overall series is titled, Who Will We Be? Doing Theology as Though Our Bodies Matter. And the title of this specific lecture is The Difference in Us, Why Our Bodies Matter. Please welcome Dr. Brian Bantam. Good afternoon, everyone. How are you? Good. Good. So things have changed a little bit. You'll notice a piano in the background. So for my, the second half of my talk, it will be lecture slash performance. No, I'm, no, I'm just messing. There's like some groans like, oh, I'm just messing. Uh, no one wants to hear me sing. Um, so we are in our second um, talk this afternoon. I want to talk a little bit about the body. And I know that each one of these uh, are kind of supposed to be their own self-contained thing. Um, but there's still a kind of a certain arc that I'm, I'm working within. And if you weren't here this morning, one of the things that I wanted to kind of begin to think about was this question of difference. Difference as foundational to what it means to be a Christian, um, foundational to God's own life and being. And in the midst of that difference, not being just a difference that exists, like, oh, this is this and this is that. Um, we have oranges and we have apples. We have you and you have me. But in fact, the difference really understood inside of God's life is a dynamic, unfolding movement of life. Um, that inside of God's life, there are persons, Father, Son, Spirit. Um, there is likeness, each made of the same stuff. And yet at the same time, that is not simply that they are different or that they are of the same that constitutes who they are, but it is this unfolding, eternal, begetting movement, life with, that is the nature of God's life. And so the question then becomes, what happens when we begin to think about who we are? What does Christian life and existence mean if it's grounded in this difference, but a difference that is moving, that is dynamic in some ways? And so this afternoon, what I want us to begin to think about is this question of what does it mean that you and I are made in this image of God, um, this image of difference? an image of likeness, but an image of likeness and difference that is dynamic and that is moving. And so in some ways, I think what I'm going to do for most time, for most of our time, is simply kind of maybe retell the story of our beginnings, if that's okay. Um, but as I begin to retell it, I want you to begin to hear and listen for maybe a slightly different texture, for almost a kind of current, for, um, in the words of this morning, the true, true underneath the moment of scripture. And part of what I'm trying to do in this retelling is that I want us to be able to account for the difference that we see in the midst of us. 
Um, I want us to be able to account for race, for gender, for sexuality, um, the fact that we are animals, but we are also human. We are like the ground, we are of the ground, but yet we are distinct from the ground. Um, how do we begin to acknowledge that, the, that this difference exists? Um, and then what do we do with it in the midst of that? So if you know your scripture, you know that in the very beginning there was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. And one of the stories that shapes who we think we are is that in the midst of God's creation, God creates these things, these beings. Um, theologian Phyllis Tribble calls them earth creatures, right? So that, that in some ways the notion of gender was less important than they were of the earth. They were these things, these beings that kind of come out of the ground. And God says, let us make them in our image. Let us make them male and female. Let us make them in our image. And so we begin there because in some ways we already have this current, a movement, right? We have likeness. But the likeness, the image of likeness here is not an image as a picture, a still, a kind of thing that you can throw up on the wall and see and study. As I've already mentioned this morning, that perhaps image is less about um, a static picture and more about a kind of movie, a series of images, a movement of images that is God's life that is moving over and over and over again. And so when we see the creation of these two creatures, we begin to see this notion of likeness and that likeness is a way of being, perhaps. Less to do with ontology, it's a fancy word of saying being, like what I am, what's fundamental to me, and more about a way, a way I live, a way I commune. And so if you remember the story, right, like so we have um, God is kind of created, um, the stars, the sky, the creatures, the, the sun, the moon, like so everything is coming. And again, notice this kind of, this kind of multiplication of difference in the creative acts. And yet on the sixth day, God pauses and waits and says, um, I want, we want to make something that is like us. Right? And so God begins to make something that is like, and so what does God do? God kind of takes this clay, this dirt, and God breathes God's self into it and forms this creature. And this first creature God calls man, human, something that is different. And now notice that in this moment, the image of God is not full, right? Because we, we kind of fast forward a little bit into the second account, and God says, um, God brings all of these creatures to Adam, Adam's naming them. Um, but at the end of the day, Adam, God says, um, you know, this isn't good. It's not good. I was, this is like, I'm, I'm, I'm saying a lot of anti, I'm, I'm kind of against the patriarchy if you can't tell. Um, but, but I want you, I just, we just mean to flag this though, right? Because for as long, as much as we kind of talk about the kind of, there's all these kind of patriarchal notions of man, blah, 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 of men. Uh, but notice in actuality, if we're going to be really biblical about it, Adam's the first thing that's not good. Right? If we're going to be biblical about it, plants good, trees good, night good, day good, but good, 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 good. Adam, eh, could be better. Now, of course, it's not Adam in Adam's essence, right? That's not him that's not good. But in a sense, what, what's not good in this moment is to say simply that Adam is not image of God yet. It's not good for Adam to be alone. And as far and as long as Adam is alone, notice this, Adam is not imago Dei, not made in the image of God. So in a way, he's not fully himself, not fully human, not fully bearing the likeness of who this God is until someone is taken out of him. Until there is a creature that is fashioned, that is like him, that is made of the same stuff. We'll throw out a fancy theological term since we're doing the Wiley lectures. Unless, see, Adam needs another who is homoousios with him of the same stuff. It's fancy, right? It's gonna impress your friends. Where does this word come from? This word comes from the doctrine of the Trinity, that we have the Father, the Son, and the Spirit, that each are different persons, but each one is of the same stuff, homoousios with the other, right? So when we say what Adam is to be made in the image of God, 
At Eve is made to be in the image of God. They are made to be of the same stuff, but then the second part, right? But they are not image of God until they are in relationship with one who is of the same stuff, but is not them. So notice here that this idea of the image of God is already something that is stretching, that is moving, that is dynamic, because it's not simply that God breathes into them, plunks them down, and there's inanimate objects that are image of God. Right? It is not until they see another. Adam wakes up, sees this other, says, whoa, man. Ah, it took, it took us to see what I did there, see what I did. And then he says, what, who is this bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh? And in that moment that he sees her and she sees him, that is image of God. Difference, confronted by one who is not you, who on the one hand seems to think, seems to move, seems to bear a certain resemblance to you, and at the same time also is distinct. Perhaps in facial features, perhaps in height, perhaps in skin color, perhaps in whatever. And in some ways, we might make, say that this is fundamentally what gender is in this moment. Kind of depending on which theologian you choose. So one a theologian of the early church, Gregory of Nyssa, think, he didn't even think sex existed in Eden. He says, like, they just, because they were so pure, they just, pff, they just popped out new people, I guess. I'm not exactly sure what happened. So for Gregory, like, you didn't even need to procreate. Your bodies weren't even necessary. So male femaleness in some regards is really just a visual indicator of a difference, that I am not you and you are not me. That in the same way inside of God's life, the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Spirit is neither the Father nor the Son, there is difference inside of our lives, our lives together. We are confronted by people who are not us, and yet at the same time, they are of us, they are made of us, we are bound to them. In many ways, this first moment of the, of, the, of the creation of humanity actually has nothing to do with marriage. Because if to be married is to, made, to be made in the image of God, then somehow all of the, all your single folk are in a world of hurt. Right? I gotta get, get married so I can be a mago day. So I can be full, so I can be complete. So if that's not it, what does it mean to be made in the image of God? It simply means that your identity is, n is bound to others. That we are not individuals. That who I am is always contingent on the, way, on the people who see me, who call me by my name, and whom I call beloved. So to be image of God is not to have a quality of rationality, a quality of choice, a quality of being able of command and creativity. It is the recognition of these folks who are bound to you and at the same time you have to live into them. In the same way, inside of God's life, the Father and the Son and the Spirit are moving and living towards one another over and over and over again. Now this is one aspect of the Imago Dei, that we are made of relationship, that we are made bound to one another. But notice the other aspect of what it means to be made in the image of God is that we are also drawn out of the ground, of dirt, of clay. And being drawn out of the dirt and the clay constitutes our personhood so much so that when God breathes into that moment, every fiber of our being clings together because God wills it to cling together. That before the moment of creation, we are like sand on a beach. My kids, whenever we would go to the, sand, the, the beaches of North Carolina, we would drink, bring our, our pails and they would run down, they would make sand castles. And as soon as their feet hit the beach, so you start stuffing sand into the, into the buckets, pouring it out, trying to make themselves little sand castles. And of course, what would happen? Pour it out. <sighs> Try it again. <sighs> Daddy, the sand's broken. I'm like, stupid, you need water. <laughs> I didn't call them stupid. I just looked at them as though they were. Uh, <laughs> I say, come on, dummy, like, let's go down to the water. So we got a bucket of water, we get sand in this water, and we pack it in there real good, turn it over, pull it out. Whoa, they're like, Daddy, you fixed it, you're amazing. I'm like, thanks. 
I am awesome. So it got, it got a lot, parenting got a lot harder after that. Um, <laughs> that was about the easiest part. But what's going on here? That, that sand just by itself, constituted by its own sandedness, right? Has no form, cannot hold shape cannot be anything but this loose, these loose grands. But combined with the moisture, the life, the water of God's own life, permeating every single grain, what happens? But it binds together and has shape. And as long as it coexists, lives inside of that movement, that space that is God's life, it retains who it is, retains its shape. So now notice here, this notion of difference and likeness is not only bound to who I am and who you are and our lives together, but difference and likeness is actually even constitutes my very body and life. My body is this, con- this movement of cells and functions that become organs, that become a circulatory system, that become breath, so much so that I am moving and living and abiding in this world, in this body, in this place. So to be made in the image of God is difference, likeness, and a bodiliness, a structure that is held together by God's own willing and being. And then we might say the last part of the Imago Day, if we think about it in terms of, say, flesh and spirit, of relationality. But to be made in the image of God is simply not these things that we are, these bodies that we have, or even our relationships, but it is a certain kind of relationship. Because unlike other creatures, we have a certain degree of freedom. We can choose things. We can do things or not do things. You know, most animals, when it becomes a certain season, they, they tend to do certain things, right? They react instinctually. I don't want to get into an argument. Like, I don't know. Like, they have souls. They don't have souls. Like, I don't know. All I know is that if you put, a, you put Mr. Bull in a pen with Mrs. Cow at a certain time of season, Bull's going to do what a Bull's going to do, right? Bull's not going to say, eh, you know, Farmer Bob, I really love the black and white cows, I'm just gonna wait till you give me one of those cows I like. No, bull's gonna rrr, whatever, or whatever it is the bulls do. I don't even know. I've never been to a farm like that, so I don't. I don't watch. Uh, no, but what? Are, but we as human beings, we have a certain degree of freedom. We choose. We love. We see this person across the street, and we say, "Oh, I like that person. Seems very interesting to me." And then we kind of sheepishly like, hi, who are you? Like, I notice what you're reading. Like, I don't, I'm actually really bad at this. So I don't even know what that looks like. But, but we choose, right? We have a certain kind of freedom. But notice that what our freedom is, we kind of think of this idea of freedom in the modern moment as a freedom of choice, a freedom of will, right? That kind of I can see all of these different options and then I can choose the one that I should pursue. But maybe, but in, in a way, that's a, a little bit of a lie, a little bit of a distortion of what our freedom is, because that freedom doesn't even exist inside of God's own life, right? God, take this cup from me. If it's your will, let it be done. But I don't want to do this. Inside of God's life, if there really are these distinct persons moving and bending towards one another, there is this freedom, but the freedom is always oriented towards the life and the purpose and the flourishing of these others. And so when we see Adam and Eve in the garden, in that moment, they are free. They are free to eat of anything that they want. But that freedom is oriented towards what? Towards stewardship. Towards care. Towards being with one another. Towards abiding with one another. Towards listening to one another. It is not freedom to do whatever they want. Right? Because Adam, Frank, maybe Adam wakes up his first day before Eve comes, and Adam loves to eat these oranges. He wakes up and says, like, mm, what's this orange thing? I'm like, oh, that's so delicious. This is great. Sees a little spot down by the river, goes down to the river, eats his little orange by the river. Oh, this is wonderful. I could do this forever. Then he falls asleep, wakes up. Whoa, man, what's up? Hey, guess what? I'll call you Eve. Hey, Eve, this is what we do. We eat oranges down by the river. So he gives her an orange. She's like, ew, that's gross. I don't want to eat an orange. He's like, fine, what do you want to eat? She's like, um, I'm trying to think of a good, a pear. Let's have a pear. He's like, let's eat this pear. He's like, okay, let's go down by the river. You can eat a pear. 
And then she says, well, what about if we and then went up to the hill, up the hill? I want to see the trees. I want to eat, eat my pear while eating by the trees. And, and Adam's like, no, man. We're eating oranges by the river. That's what we do. I was made first. I get to decide. She's like, no, I want to eat a pear on the hill. And now they just stare at each other. And you're like, thanks, God. This is great. There's a theologian, um, Dietrich, a Lutheran theologian, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, when he describes this, motion, this moment of creation, he says that there is a gift in the limit. He says that Adam is not really free when he's by himself. That Adam is not really a mago Dei when he's by himself. Now, why is this the case? Because when Adam is by himself, he looks at all of the trees and all of the fruit and all of the animals and all of the land, and he thinks all of it is for him to serve his purposes, to satisfy his delights, to joy in, to consume. In a way, all of this, he might actually think he's like God in a certain kind of way. And so God says, no, 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 you can't understand because you don't even know who I am. If that's what you think the world is for, if you think the world is for your consumption, if the world is for your perpetual f choice, you don't know me. So in order for you to be image of God, you need another, another who is your limit, in Bonhoeffer's word. And the limit is a gift. Because the limit helps us to see that our freedom is not really freedom if we think that we can do whatever we want. That real freedom is freedom when it is oriented towards another. When it is oriented towards the ground, when it is tending, when it is creating, when it is listening, when it is bear, bearing, when it is reciprocating what is given. When I have to look at the other and I care about their needs, I care about their hopes, I care about their story more than I care about my own life or need or story. That is freedom. And so to be made in the image of God is to be bound to the ground to be permeated by God's spirit and life, to be bound to another such that I am not who I am without you and you are not who you are without me and that we are free to love, free to see our lives and stories joined together such that I am willing to acknowledge what I do not know, what I cannot know other than that you are with me. And so when we begin to think about the significance of our difference, the significance of our bodied lives, the well, question now is, well, what went wrong? Where do we begin to see these differences? Well, notice what happens, right? Well, Adam and Eve are passing by the tree over and over and over again. And because they're really free and God is willing to whisk, risk this freedom, God gives this tree of knowledge of good and evil and says, don't eat that one. A limit, right? It's the gift it reminds them of who they are and of who they're not. But they look by, they go over and over, and they say, that looks good, though. I, oh, man, if it could, be, it could be really good. What do you think? I, I think it could be good, too. And so they're talking every day, they pass by that tree. So finally, they're like, oh, surely, surely we won't really die. God's, God's cool, right? God's OK. God's not going to kill us. That seems a little extreme, right? So they eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, and their eyes are opened, and they're naked and ashamed. Now notice, they didn't die. They were kind of sort of right, right? But in their eyes being opened, what can we begin to account for in this fall? In their eyes being opened, all of a sudden, maybe, perhaps, we could say they now see these differences. But now, instead of seeing them as differences that they should be for and that are for them, they see these differences and can only be drawn into consumptive desire. Adam sees Eve, says, mm, girl, you're looking good. And Eve says, why don't look at me like that? Eve looks at Adam, says, mm, man, you're looking good. Things I want to do to you. And he's like, dang, girl. All of a sudden, they don't see difference, bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. They see difference as something that is for them to satisfy their need, their curiosity, their consumptive desires. 
Difference is no longer a gift, but something to be conquered. And so they hide themselves. They take this gift of, the tr- of trees, of creation, and they bend them and they break them in order to cover themselves because they don't even know what to do with their own differences. They become alienated from their own bodies in such a way that they cannot even see the goodness in themselves or the goodness in the other. And so they hide themselves from God, and God says to them, what's going on, Adam and Eve? And what is the first thing that Adam does? He says, that one that you gave me. He doesn't even put his, her name in his mouth. That one that you gave me. She did it. And you're like, what happened to bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh, right? We're in this together. And you have to wonder, right? Like, I wonder what would happen if in that moment, Adam and Eve hiding behind the bush, if God had said, yo, what happened? And Adam and Eve, you know what? You know what happened? The thing is, is that that, that fruit looked good. And we were, we were, we kind of messed up. And, and we, and now our eyes are opened and we say, we, we see way too much. We cannot handle what we see. We're really sorry. We're in this together. But still, I'm bo- we're bone to bone, flesh to flesh. I'm not her without me. She's not me without her. Please, God, let us like do this. I wonder what would have happened. But instead, notice that notion of relationality, that image of Godness that was in Adam. Where there is no father without the son. There's no son without the father. There's no father and son without the spirit. There's no Adam without Eve. There's no earth creature without this other earth creature bound up in life. No, in Adam, Adam wants to be judged as an individual. It's just me here. I'm righteous. I'm the one, I, don't, there's, I bear no blame. That one you gave me, that thing, that one that, that came after me, that one that doesn't know as much, that one that didn't get the rules right. The one that you shackled me with. I was going to be fine here, right? Eating my orange down by the river. This one you gave me, she did it. And notice in this moment, we see our very first moment, fragmentation of human fallenness. Of difference now, no longer as bone of bone and flesh and flesh, but difference as violent differentiation. Because the only way that Adam can maintain his righteousness, the only way that he can maintain his sense of himself is by destroying Eve. That one is guilty. And so what we find in our fallen world of, different, of violent differentiation is that the only way we can establish our innocence, establish our nationality, establish our inness, our beauty, our power, our love, our, our authenticity in a fallen world is through a distinction of what is not us. There is no beauty without ugly. There is no intelligent without the dumb. There is no able without the disabled in a fallen world. And so this moment is actually more than simply two individuals struggling to understand who they are and who God is in their midst. What we see in this very moment is the very first splitting of a fundamental demonic structural system. That in a world where our eyes are opened and we feel nothing but shame and fear, we stabilize ourselves by stepping on the heads and bodies of those who are weaker. And while we get a few gasps of air in the midst of a, a flooded area, we do, not me- we do not even care about the bodies that are dead and drowning under our feet. God says to Eve, Eve, what have you done? Eve says, it's the creature, it's the ground, it's this earth, it's this body you gave us. It has these urges, these desires, these things that I can't seem to control, these voices in my head that tell me that I do this. And so what happens? It is our body's fault, and we yearn for a spirit, something beyond all of the lust and the pain and the hunger that are, constitute our body's lives. And so what begins to happen? But we use this freedom that we have no longer 
for bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, to build, to create, to nourish, and to be nourished, to love, and to be loved, to see, and to be seen. We use the freedom that we have to make classifications and distinctions of guilt and of guilty and innocent, of true and false, of defiled and clean. And then we begin to build those systems into systems that are not simply about you and me, but it is about us and them. Citizen and alien, white and black, male and female, such that all of a sudden we, have all, we are born into this world and our bodies are doing all of this work that are marked with all of these stories, and these implications and these, these powers and characteristics that we don't even know what they mean. And yet at the same time, when I think that I should say something, I have something to say in this class, I don't because I don't think what my word, that my words matter. Because I'm not as smart as that guy. He doesn't use, I don't use big words like him. And so when we think about the fallen world that we exist in, we exist in, in a world where our, our bodies have to navigate these differences, where they, they are born into. I talk about it a lot, that our body does this work all of the time, even before we enter into a, as soon as we enter into a room, our bodies are doing this work and they're being seen and interpreted and we feel it, or some of us do. And so why do we do this theology as, our, as though our bodies matter? Because when we think about our fallen condition, it is not merely that we broke a law. It's not merely the violation of, it's not merely an act of disobedience. It's not even pride, this desire to be like God and steal something from God. Perhaps in the fall, the orientation of our bodied lives, the need that we're given as gift, is now all oriented not towards one another, but actually oriented only for the sustenance of myself and of those who I deem like me or like another. The question for us going forward is going to be, if the fall is not simply about the violation of a law, about a status as damned or saved, perhaps there's something else. And the reason, one of the reasons that we can say that it is about something else is because when God moves to save us, God moves to save us not through fiat, not through declaration, but through presence. Not only in Jesus' life, but also throughout the life of Israel. Every time Israel lives into or away from faithfulness, God is present. God sends a body. God sends a woman. God sends a prostitute. God sends a foreigner. God sends a crazy prophet. God sends a body who represents the truth that God is with us. And this testament gets witnessed to in the moment most profoundly in the incarnation. Because if our lives were only about spirit, if our lives were only about a kind of right standing, about getting to a place called heaven, certainly God did not need to be a body. And yet in the incarnation, what we see is a fundamental affirmation that our bodies matter. That something about being made in the image of God is actually constitutive of this material life I live in. Of food, language, taste, touch. The ways that who I am are fundamentally bound up into this body. We know this because now in the incarnation, the word becomes Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Mary, this particular Jewish man. And not just for a little vacation. The word's not just like, oh, I'm just going to chill out here for a little bit. Let's see what earth is like. No. In the incarnation, the word becomes this man forever. In the beautiful words of Karl Barth, God chooses not to be God without us. God is a body. God is a particular person. 
And in the particularity of that personhood, God wants to redeem us. God wants to set the interrelationship between our flesh and spirit right. God wants to touch the fracture and alienation that we feel with our own bodies. God wants to speak to the violent differentiations of me and you, us and them, that somehow that we live into almost seamlessly, almost unconsciously. God in this body wants us to orient our freedom towards one another in ways that allow us to be free only when we are bound to others' freedom as well. But of course, I'm getting ahead of myself for tomorrow. But let me leave you with this. When we begin to think about our bodied lives, about the, the possibilities of the particularity of who we are, we become opened up to the ways that these differences, our differences, allow us to be more free. It allows us to confess the ways that we've been formed by social systems and constructions of what gender and race ought to be. And it allows us to see ourselves more faithfully. My wife and I went through a little bit of, a, of this when we, were, when we were married. We'd been married for a while. We'd been married for about 10 years, 15 years. No, something like that, 12 years. It was a, it was a, it was a minute, it was a long time. And then my wife, like, and we've, like, we consider ourselves a pretty egalitarian couple. Like, I take care of the kids. Like, she's working. Like, I'm working. So we're, we, I, thought, I thought I was woke. Let's put it that way. I thought I was woke. And, and my wife, her, she's, a, she's a pastor, and, and, she, and her work kind of started to really pick up, having a lot of evening meetings, blah, blah, blah. And so I come home from teaching one day, um, and she's getting ready to run out to another meeting. I'm like, yo, babe, that's cool. Um, what's for dinner? And she's like, um, I don't know, what is for dinner? I was like, hey, you know, you know, because like, you always, you know, you always make it. She's like, well, look, I've been like doing all this and like, like I got to do all this and grocery shop and figure out the meals and do all this. Like you just came home at three o'clock. You could do some of this too, right? I was like, oh, yeah, probably. So I started thinking about it. And I was like, dang, like, who knew? Like, somebody that, like, knows about, like, critical theory, who understands kind of questions of justice, fall into these patterns too, right? Even without thinking about it. You just make these assumptions because that's who you think you are. So I'm starting to, like, do my little thing. I'm learning how to make spaghetti and then, like, kimchi fried rice and doing all this kind of stuff. And lo and behold, I actually begin to find that I like it. I like, I like the chopping, it kind of likes, I like the, I like the, like the, mmm, dad, this was so delicious. Um, I like finding new recipes, I like trying to experiment with different kinds of things. I love it, actually. And what my lo wife loves is eating food that she didn't make. <laughs> it was amazing, and so for 12 years, we had lived into this kind of gendered stereotype of what the household ought to look like. And yet, when we actually looked at one another, lived into the possibility that we, these, gender, these gender norms were not determinative of who we are and who we ought to be and what we ought to be good at, it actually allowed us to discover something new about ourselves. It actually lived, allowed us to live into the fullness of who we were, of who we were made to be in deeper and fuller ways. So as we begin to think about this idea of Christian discipleship, of Christian life, of why our bodies matter, is that we have to begin to think about both the ways that we are made in the image of God, our likeness, our differences, but also the ways in which we tend to distort these images on an everyday basis. Now tomorrow we'll begin to ask this question, what does it mean that Jesus comes as flesh, that the word becomes flesh? How can we begin to name the ways that God overturns these, strat these structures and systems and incorporates us into God's life for a life of freedom? But for now, we'll end with this promise that God made us to be like God. And that is good, a good thing. Thank you.